Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Heather Beal. I'm the founder and president of Blocks. Um, today, we're going to be talking uh, about uh, the impact of disaster on parents and uh, caregivers or guardians. Uh, with me today, I have a very distinguished panel, uh, Holly Nett, who's the director of Child Care Emergency Partnerships, Child Care Aware of America. Jonathan Surrey, the project director for the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. And Dr. CJ Huff, excuse me, <laughs> tripping over my own tongue this morning. It is morning my time, uh, who is a very distinguished educator and ad child advocate. So if you wanna learn more about our wonderful speakers, uh, please do refer back to uh, the book that you got and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're gonna start a little bit with Holly. Thank you, Heather. I am honored to be a part of the workshop today, and I look forward to this afternoon's dialogue that will help all of us advance response and recovery efforts for our youngest children. So next slide, please. Child Care Aware of America is a national membership-based nonprofit that focuses exclusively on child care. We serve as our nation's leading voice for child care taking a broad approach to the goal of improving the country's childcare system. Our mission is to advance a childcare system that effectively serves all children and families. And our work is strengthened by the national network of childcare resource referral agencies and the diverse members that we have and partners. Next slide, please. Childcare Aware of America works with more than 600 state and local childcare resource and referral agencies. Um, every state in the country has a childcare resource and referral agency, and they help to ensure that families have access to quality, affordable childcare. These agencies are a constant presence in their local communities, and they serve as a trusted resource for childcare providers and families. The services offered by these organizations typically include child care program referrals for families, consumer ed, and financial assistance to pay for child care, professional development and technical assistance to child care program staff, advocacy on early childhood issues, and recruitment and retention of child care programs and communities, as well as partnership building. We believe that with the proper training and resources, that child care resource and referral agencies can serve as resilience hubs that reduce and possibly even prevent the suffering of people impacted by disasters, especially those most vulnerable, our children. Next slide, please. Over 15 million parents and 8.7 million children depend on child care every day. So when disasters occur, the most vulnerable are those youngest citizens, children under five years of age. Increasingly, children of this age are separated from their parents during the hours when emergencies may occur because they're in childcare settings. Childcare programs are particularly vulnerable to disasters because children are often not able to protect themselves and they rely on caregivers for their safety. So in times of calm, as well as in times of disaster, we at Child Care Aware of America use our relationships, our data and technology to help communities understand the landscape of child care before, during and after an emergency. One of the key areas that we've focused our efforts on over the past several years includes preparedness. And we offer this by offering resources, training and technical assistance to child care providers. Our primary focus has been centered on delivering a training of trainers for the staff at child care resource and referral agencies so that they in turn can provide assistance to providers in their service area. In addition, we help child care resource and referral agencies and partners determine needs by conducting damage assessment surveys and offering direct outreach as after a disaster. Before a disaster as well, such as a if a hurricane is approaching, and we want to check the path and see the impact to child care programs. By harnessing our unique GIS mapping capabilities, we can show the location and status of child care providers to aid first responders, emergency management, and those such as child care resource and referral agencies to offer support. 
Another service that we've provided is we help childcare resource referral agencies and families locate temporary childcare if their existing childcare program is impacted by a disaster. Um, our overall goal is to help displaced children receive a safe place for their care so that communities can recover. Next slide, please. Caring for children is a big responsibility under normal conditions so that when something out of that normal happens, such as a natural disaster or an emergency, caring for children becomes an even greater responsibility. The safety and well-being of children is a primary concern of child care providers. It takes a great deal of trust for parents to leave their children in a care setting. So when a disaster occurs, this trust takes on a whole new dimension. A well-prepared child care workforce is critical to ensure that children's safety is maintained. How child care providers respond in an emergency matters. So we believe that well-trained caregivers will likely provide the emotional and physical support that children and families deserve um, in the midst of a disaster. Next slide, please. There's been little research focused on childcare emergency preparedness for infants and toddlers. So Child Care Aware of America is working to fill that gap. We surveyed early learning professionals from across the country in 2018, and we asked them to share information about how they would evacuate infants and toddlers and their experiences with this um, as they care for children. Next slide, please. Since infants and toddlers are most vulnerable in emergencies and help getting, or getting them help takes extra planning and preparation, it's our goal to expand resources and training specific to our country's youngest children. Almost one in every five survey respondent said that they've had to evacuate infants and toddlers due to an emergency. And those types of emergency were fire and smoke, gas leaks or gas smells, and severe weather, um, those were the top reasons for evacuation. We wanna place focus on this area because infants and toddlers have unique needs, um, very unique needs to preschoolers and definitely um, unique needs compared to school age children. They're reliant on caregivers for physical, nutritional and emotional needs. They have limited communication skills, limited mobility, and the need for safety and protection from harmful items is a key. Next slide, please. Over the past decade, numerous disasters have occurred, and as a result, child care programs, families, and children have been directly impacted. In 2012, our country was faced with Superstorm Sandy. Nearly 700 child care programs in Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York closed. The closure time varied from one month up to eight months. In 2016, Louisiana faced flooding. 87 child care programs in the Baton Rouge area reported damage. After a month after the flooding occurred, 45 of those child care programs still were closed. In 2017, with Hurricane Harvey, in the greater Houston area, more than 660 child care programs reported damages and multiple child care programs were closed. That same year, California wildfires um, were underway as well. 250 wildfires burned across Northern California and 21 of those wildfires became major fires that burned at least 245,000 acres. 15 licensed child care facilities burned to the ground, displacing 444 children in Sonoma County. Each of these historical disasters crippled the region's child care supply, which in turn impacted the community's ability to recover. Child care resource referral agencies and partners play a key role in recovery. Resources can be funneled to those areas most in need if relationships are built prior to disasters happening. Outreach, outreach can begin now, um, and that's one of the things that we work with, this child care resource referral agencies is helping them understand the emergency um, management world and starting those conversations between the two uh, to open up um, relationships and build on um, support that might be available after a disaster. Next slide, please. 
So recognizing that emergency preparedness, response and recovery is vital to the well-being of children, families and communities, our team at Child Care Aware of America and the members that we work with are committed to provide resources um, to child care providers and partnering agent agencies to support the needs of the child care sector before, during and after disasters. Next slide, please. So for more information and to learn about the work that we're doing, you can go to childcareprepare.org um, and find resources that we provide for child care providers, but also some previously recorded webinars and ideas for how to strengthen partnerships. So um, thank you for this opportunity today, and I welcome any questions that you may have after the other presenters have presented. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. That was fantastic. We're going to turn next to Jonathan, who's going to talk a little bit about social services, foster care, and CBOs. Jonathan, are you ready? I am. All right, can you all see that? Awesome, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to present here today. Um, I'm sorry we can't be together in person to um, see all of your faces, um, but I assume everybody is behind a computer somewhere. Um, so, um, and, and thank you to my, my panelists as well. Um, uh, in some way, I think we've all been connected one way or another over the years. Um, so today I'm going to try and um, summarize a few key issues that have uh, emerged through um, the past few years of our research at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute, um, along with um, some anecdotal observations and recommendations that I've gathered um, through the various communities that I've been working with um, on building child-focused community resilience in, in multiple different locations in Puerto Rico, um, in North Carolina, in Arkansas, and in New York. So I'm going to walk you through some data points um, that should help illustrate a couple of the of the concepts I'd like to drive home today um, and then um, finish up with those recommendations. Um, so we are, as you all know, in a very rapidly evolving disaster landscape where we're now having to juggle and balance uh, not only emerging infectious diseases, but extreme weather events, um, technological and man-made disasters, and managing a, a very large influx of information um, at a higher rate and a higher volume than we ever have had before. And so our management of these disasters and our community partners and communicating that information with community partners um, has become so much more complex. Um, and so the, the, the planning that is required to address some of these issues with this uh, evolving landscape um, needs to um, evolve with that landscape as well. Um, so there's two, two main issues and themes that I'd like to, to drive home today that's based on some of our research with Hurricane Katrina, recovery, Superstorm Sandy recovery, and our work at the community level after Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Maria. Um, in each of these communities that we've worked with, there is a pre-existing housing crisis, um, crises, um, plural. Um, we are dealing with high-risk housing, housing that is built in areas that it should not be built in because the risk is so great. We're dealing with issues of poor and delayed mitigation and housing policies that are either allowing um, homes to be built in areas in which they should not be built or preventing um, adequate mitigation efforts to allow homes to be built in some of those areas. And in the post-disaster context, we're dealing with very slow reconstruction and rebuilding. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the flow of money as well. And we're also dealing with um, severe mental health issues. Um, and, and the awareness of mental health issues over the past few years has increased greatly, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that. Um, but there is such an important factor of, of making sure that parent and guardian uh, mental health is uh, addressed and taken care of because parents and guardians do have an incredible influence on the well-being of their children and the, um, the children that are in their household. Um, and we've also had to see that um, if we have trust in some of these child-serving institutions, as, as Holly was saying, trust in knowing that our children can go to a safe daycare, that they can go to a safe school, then parents can actually go back to work and we can have a resumption of the economy and we can begin recovery. The landscape again has changed due to COVID-19, but in a natural disaster or um, man-made disaster, uh, this is a typical um, workflow that we'd like to see uh, as far as um, uh, recovery. 
Um, this is a, a, a very large overview of a socio-ecological model of recovery um, that we will not get in today, but I wanted to draw your attention to a, a handful of outcomes that we know based on some of our research at NCDP that are incredibly valuable. Um, to consider. And the first is housing stability, meaning um, that somebody knows that they're living in a home that they don't need to leave anytime soon. Um, they have stable economic resources, good mental health, good physical health, and positive social role adaptation. So we're going to focus on housing stability and mental health. Um, so some research from our research, some research data after um, um, some of our studies after Superstorm Sandy showed that residents that had major structural damage, and these are based on FEMA definitions, are two and a half times as likely to have trouble paying uh, rent, bills, mortgage, food, transportation, regardless of their income. Um, that's a significant stressor in the household, and that stressor translates into mental health impacts. Um, and residents living in poverty were um, 6.7 6 times as likely to have experienced trouble paying bills. Um, this is what we call the poverty trap. These are these pre-existing social determinants of health that um, have very severe downstream effects. And so the link here is financial stress resulting in impacts in mental health. Um, another factor is damage to a home. Um, homes that experience major and minor damage result in two and a half to 3.7 times um, the likelihood of experiencing PTSD. Um, and another predictor of that PTSD is a prior history of de depression. So these pre-existing social determinants of health actually make a really, really big difference. Looking at Hurricane Harvey, uh, this is some unpublished data from a recent study of ours. Um, we found out that um, how these are households with children, um, that 40% of households with children still needed help with home repairs. Harvey was in 2017. 27% still needed housing assistance. These are very staggering numbers. And if we look at, compare them to minor damage, these are all risks for mental health and PTSD outcomes. Um, similarly, 37% um, of individuals, um, heads of households, felt that their life was still disrupted. And over 60% felt that they were still not, their household itself was still not recovered. And looking at Hurricane Katrina data and housing stability, um, those who are unstably housed are almost twice as likely to have a child whose academic performance is worse and almost twice as much um, as likely to have an emotional problem, their child having uh, reported an emotional problem. And there are additional data points on um, the, uh, the, the parent and guardian mental health having an impact as well. Um, so there's a few takeaways. Um, I think that we need to invest in long-term financial support to community-based organizations to offer housing repair and extend the duration of housing assistance programs. Um, there's so much to be said about people living in a home that they are comfortable in and um, knowing that there are people living out there that are still not in stable housing, um, even after Hurricane Florence as well, which is more recent, um, is, is very, very concerning. Um, we need to build the capacity of parents and guardians to serve as resilience buffers for children. Um, this includes supporting programming to create trauma-informed communities, um, in addition to uh, building in academic research initiatives for those types of programs to see if creating a trauma-informed community does result in a more resilient community after a disaster. We need to proactively address and plan for the long-term mental health impacts of a disaster. Um, many of these disasters are, are long-term in nature, and as we deal with um, compounding disasters, uh, as we're finding out with COVID-19, um, these are gonna take a, a very careful um, level and detail of planning. Um, and to continue to build education awareness campaigns around these mental health issues. And again, I, I'm happy to see that there's so much that has been done around this. Um, we need to create a formal integration with local emergency management, um, with childcare licensing and social services um, to really focus in on preparedness issues. I see some um, independent uh, planning efforts that go on, but I rarely see a cohesive planning effort between all of these different agencies within government. And we know that local emergency management uh, plays such a critical role in getting people to the table, but they are often under-resourced and under capacity to be able to do this. And we also recommend considering a child, um, a child specific community liaison that can represent a community based organizations needs um, of, of children in the community. Um, and finally, um, we need to unite preparedness and planning guidance um, and technical and financial assistance for child care centers. Uh, I think we typically see that child care centers um, are under resourced, they're understaffed, they're underpaid. 
um, and they are often, along with the CCRNRs, burdened with collecting data for larger government organizations to find out the status of child care centers um, after a disaster. And this needs to be supported um, through funding and um, additional initiatives. Um, foster families, we found, um, many times are not required to have um, household disaster plans, and we recommend that um, this needs to be um, a policy that needs to be in place, as well as resources that are available to be able to create those plans. Our team has created a foster care planning template specifically for um, foster families or out-of-home out placement scenarios. Um, and with the current situation, we need to shift our all hazards planning approach to all hazards at once to, to accommodate some of these compounding crises. And finally, um, we need to connect with and continue to listen to the needs of these affected communities. Um, and that is beyond where the funding ends, but um, is extended into what is experienced by these communities. Um, and we, um, in Puerto Rico, we've been working with kind of taking on a new level to the Children and Youth Task Force that was founded um, very uh, early on after the, the um, uh, after Hurricane Maria um, and trying to extend those through our Community Resilience Coalition work. Um, and it is a very great model um, and it's something that um, can be implemented um, across the country um, and territories. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for this opportunity and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more later. Thank you, Jonathan. I was frantically scribbling notes and you were talking so fast and I was trying to catch up before you finished, but thank you so much for your wonderful information. Whew, you guys got me working today. Okay, next we're going to move on to um, CJ Huff, who's going to talk about some local level examples, communication, school, schools as trusted locations and, and mental health concerns for uh, parents and guardians of children. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. And I think Mike's uh, given me control here of the screen. So I'm going to share a screen here and get, uh, get my presentation going. So as I do that, I just want to uh, do a quick shout out to one of my favorite people that I see is on, on as an attendee today, which is Suzanne Everson. Uh, Suzanne, hello. And um, uh, my, my background is briefly um, related to this work. Um, I was a superintendent of schools in uh, Joplin, Missouri when tornado hit back in 2011. And since that time, I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different disaster uh, recovery scenarios specific to schools, children and youth issues. And um, I got my first uh, taste of that actually at the federal level working in Hurricane Harvey and then had the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico and spend nine months there. I had an opportunity to interact with the Children Youth Task Force and the good work that they were doing there. Uh, Jonathan, uh, good people work, working really hard and then little time in Florida and then um, out to um, California to the wildfires. And I think, I think one of the things that, that is important for, for people to, and I think you all, all get this, um, to, um, to know is that, um, that our schools really, really serve as one of the primary hubs of, of the recovery effort. Um, saw that in Joplin and I've seen that across every disaster that we've, that we've worked and, and, the, and the, how we care for children. Uh, the work we do to support kids um, in a, in a post-disaster environment um, is critically is, is a critical infrastructure component that allow the recovery to continue. And you look at what's happening now with COVID. Uh, certainly, what the schools are doing and stepping up and providing free meals to to students and families in many cases uh, to ensure that they have their nutritional meet, needs met and so on. I think I think highlights the importance of, of school systems and, and recovery efforts. Uh, so, so school systems truly, they, they are essential um, in, in a crisis um, for, for a number of reasons, for, for families and parents. Uh, number one, it's a familiar environment. Um, uh, they have trusted relationships oftentimes in the school, which is really important. Uh, the services and support that are already there. And so especially when you think about those children with access and functional needs and kids that are already receiving services for mental and behavioral health supports, and so on and so forth. The schools are, are really looked upon, even, even health-related issues uh, through the nurses' offices and, and some of the schools have school-based health clinics uh, currently that, um, that provide other su supports and services are all critically important. And then obviously other resources as well. Um, and, and so schools are, are really um, at the center of, of, um, of many disasters and, and, and families and, and parents um, rely heavily on those. Uh, this is especially true uh, for families, as I mentioned, children with access and functional needs, uh, families that are resource challenged, uh, families in poverty, and those families that are kind of on the bubble that finally that suddenly find themselves 
uh, you know, like maybe mom and dad both had, had jobs and they were getting by and they were just above the poverty line, suddenly find themselves um, uh, needing resources and not necessarily knowing where to go to access those resources. Uh, undocumented families, we saw this in particular in um, uh, Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Uh, a lot of concerns about undocumented families not coming forward and, and uh, um, seeking assistance for, you know, under the current current climate. And, and, and in terms of, um, um, uh, you know, specific disaster impacts, uh, as you look at, at school services that are provided that, that impact families and, and, and children, their individual education plans, you know, they have a right to, to an education just like every other kid. And as you think about what's happening in, in the current, uh, current climate with uh, COVID-19 and all the online learning, that's been a real challenge for schools and families in particular on how to continue to, to provide those services. Uh, so that's something that, that has to be considered, you know, the assistive devices uh, that go along with that. And then uh, certainly curriculum across the board and how to deliver that curriculum. And I know for parents and, and being one, and I don't know how many, how many of you out there are dealing with this currently, but uh, you know, even though I have an education degree, I'll tell you, it's sitting down with my, my uh, almost middle, my soon to be middle school daughter and doing homework with her is not a pleasant experience in many cases. So, you know, it, it creates some additional stress on parents and families. And that's something we're certainly seeing there. Uh, which, which unfortunately could, could result in, in some abuse uh, issues, um, you know, as parents are dealing with all these other issues on top of, uh, you know, having to educate their kids. So we know, we know that stressful, stressful, the, the environment in a, a post-disaster, post-crisis scenario uh, certainly changes the family dynamic in, in many cases and, and creates additional stress for parents, which can be taken down on our kids, it's something we have to take a look at. Uh, community services, obviously the mental health piece, you know, you talk about building capacity there. Um, that's really tough. I'll use, uh, you know, wildfires in California as an example. Uh, when you have uh, mental health uh, professionals who lost their homes in, in the wildfire or their offices in, in a wildfire and they have to move someplace else, uh, your capacity decreases while, while the need increases. And I think we see that in every disaster. And so, um, um, you know, that, that's something that, that communities, you know, from a planning standpoint, really have to take into account. Uh, the medical and dental, same, same story, second, second uh, chapter, uh, same type of scenario there. And, and then we also see, uh, you know, it's stress um, on, on um, already stressed not-for-profits and organizations in the communities that are trying to step up and meet those basic needs. And you'll see some organizations getting more, more donations or resources and others not getting as much. And, and you know the balance there, and, and trying to coordinate all that. But uh, you know, meeting those basic needs is is an ongoing challenge. It's uh, you know, on blue sky days, it's a challenge, and certainly a challenge in a post disaster environment that's exacerbated. Uh, in terms of considerations, you know, as we think about schools in particular, you know, em emphasis on EOP planning. Um, you know, I think sometimes we we go through the motions of having an EOP plan and um, and don't necessarily really think about the what ifs. I think this COVID scenario is certainly open some eyes and, and, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some, some more movement in that area. But the, the planning part of that is really important in those tabletops. Uh, digital record keeping, this was uh, especially true in uh, Maria and uh, uh, Harvey both. A lot of uh, paper records were destroyed by, by flood waters and, and rain and, and uh, damage to facilities. And so not having good records on students uh, was, a, was a challenge and then updating, keeping those uh, contact, that contact information uh, family contact information, which is always a challenge, uh, updated, and then having a continuity of learning plan. And, um, and uh, I think most, most districts are, are thinking along those lines now. And, the, and then those school community partnerships, that can't be um, emphasized enough. I know for us in, in Joplin and other, other communities um, that have been through disaster, it's those partnerships, those relationships, all disasters start, start local and end local, and having those relationships in place prior to a disaster uh, is critically important so that you can continue to provide that continuum of services to kids, even though you may have to be creative in how you deliver those services. Uh, for communities, in terms of considerations, you know, the Children and Youth Task Force was mentioned. Uh, one of the things I would say is that, you know, my experience in, in, in working with Children and Youth Task Force and post-disaster environment, it's, it's a real challenge to get those up and off the ground because everybody's so engaged and engrossed in, in the work for recovery at that point, response and recovery. And so it's kind of like planting a tree, you know, there's no better time than to plant a tree than today. And if, you know, the best time to plant it would have been yesterday. If you don't get it planted, do it today. Certainly um, that's true in this case too. Uh, for those communities that are going through disaster, having a children and youth task force focused on those children's, children and youth issues is critical. 
Uh, but if they don't have a disaster, today's, today's the day to start one. So I, I agree with Jonathan. This is a model that should be considered across the country and, and, um, and, um, and, and should be a high priority. Uh, resource mapping is something communities should be doing in advance of a disaster, you know, having those mutual aid agreements in place. Um, you know, in our case, you know, having, you know, agreements with local school districts and how we could tap mental and behavioral health supports to support our kids over the long haul, short and long haul was really important to us. Uh, e even with, uh, you know, communications and how you, how you were you know, challenged with uh, parent family communications with the schools and, and how you, how you approach that. Those university partnerships, looking at those issues that can be addressed through, through those university partnerships. And so when you have a, a depletion of mental and behavioral health staff, maybe there's some creative solutions to interns and others that can provide some supports, get, get some experience and, and, and bring some additional hands and heads to the, to the table to uh, problem solve and address some of those issues impacting our kids and youth as it relates to mental and behavioral health as an example. At the federal level, um, you know, some of my um, experiences, and I'll use one in Texas, uh, utilizing IDCMs and, and placing IDCMs in schools, um, immediate disaster case managers, and, and using those schools because they are a friendly place as a, a location uh, where IDCMs can set up and, 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 and be more attractive, I guess, than maybe a, you know, a federal, you know, a, a federal, you know, federally identified location for that. Um, you know, having those local spaces that are safe spaces that people can go to get that kind of support. We saw some, some good movement in that towards the end of the IDCM uh, uh, process when we, we started doing that in Texas and, and, um, and would recommend that. You know, assistive de device inventory, you know, just having some of those common assistive devices available in large scale disasters so that uh, we can get those uh, devices to, to uh, those kids and families quickly. You know, those philanthropic partnerships are always important. Uh, the resource database and, and SERV funding, you know, that's always an issue in, in a post-disaster environment. Uh, the SERV funding that's available through U.S. Department of Education tends to be underfunded um, typically and, and uh, just making sure we have the funding there and available to support mental and behavioral health in these schools that are experiencing crises of various kinds. So uh, that's, that's my presentation and um, look again, look forward to the, to the conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Again, a lot of great information. Uh, I've got a lot of questions already myself, but uh, we're gonna move now into discussion. If anyone in the audience has a question or comment about the specific needs of parents and guardians of children uh, and the providers and organizations that serve them during disaster, please provide that in the Q&A box. Uh, remember to state your name and affiliation for the record. And I'll go ahead and start the questions because I have a few. Uh, so lucky you guys, my panelists. Um, this first one is for Holly. We're talking about childcare. Um, what research have you found out there about the impact of the loss of childcare on recovery? I mean, we know it, but what data is actually showing it? We talk about like, say for mitigation, you know, $1 spent is worth $6 in recovery, but where's our compensament that talks about the impact of childcare? That's a really good question, and I think that's an area we still need to grow in. I think there's just so many different partners that come into play with that. Um, community development entities, um, economists, uh, there's just there's still so many different factors that play into it. So I think at this point it is a lot of anecdotal. Um, we've heard that communities struggle, um, but to have some real solid research. I think that's something that we all still need to work together on um, and elevate those needs. Thanks, Holly. I was, oh, that's what I was kind of thinking. I thought maybe you had a secret source out there that I was missing. So <laughs> I thought I'd throw it out there. <laughs> okay, um, well, I have more questions. So uh, Jonathan, uh, you're up next. Um, well, you talked about mental health programs. So I was wondering, uh, do you think we need some kind of a post-disaster mental health program for families or something that's different or, than the current uh, individual assistance support? Something maybe also for helping uh, child care providers. We often talk about them having no mental health training. What can you, uh, ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, one, I think echoing kind of what I said earlier and what CJ was saying is, um, making sure that we're 
building these programs in ahead of time. So one of those is, is creating these trauma-informed communities. And I know there's a few different models out there. Um, one of the communities that we work with in, in North Carolina has, has essentially created a cadre of um, CRIM trainers, of the Community Resilience Model trainers. And they are going around um, teaching every sector within their community and that includes healthcare and law enforcement, um, school teachers, childcare providers, social service providers, shelter workers, um, and equipping with them with a trauma-informed approach of regulating themselves um, and um, how to actually work directly with, um, with uh, children in their community and with uh, parents in their community. Um, that seems to be working really well. Um, I would say that, um, um, yeah, investing in, in building those relationships ahead of time. We also talk of, about psychological first aid. Um, I think there are tons of, of psychological first aid programs out there. Um, and that is something that uh, is not just for, um, for children, but also for healthcare, or for, for, for social service and, and um, childcare providers and teachers. Um, and what we've seen is and we also know that that should not just be for those people, that should be for all school staff that are trained, it should be for janitorial staff, administrative staff, anybody that may interact with a child should be trained um, in psychological first aid. And what we found is that there's often um, uh, a time-based challenge in requiring yet another training. And most psychological first aid trainings are a full day to get the full impact uh, of that training. There are abbreviated trainings, but the, I think my experience has been that people don't feel like that really gets you gives you enough, uh, uh, not an expansive enough tool belt to be able to utilize it effectively. And so there is a little bit of a, a resource issue there, um, but maybe that's something to be considered in onboarding requirements and ongoing professional education and really understanding and communicating the value of um, building that capacity of, of staff um, on growth. And um, childcare systems. So I think those are those are a couple of the two uh, recommendations. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Well, we're waiting for my my audience to come up with more questions. I'm going to throw one at CJ. Guess what? You're next. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I will say also that we. We started working with um, one of our communities to develop a, a mental health response and recovery plan. Um, and we started outlining a plan to approach this and set up a, a list of questions, partly based on what New York State did um, to allow their, their counties to create um, local um, mental health response plans for adults and children. Um, and it's, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, getting people to the table. And when you really take a full breadth of it, uh, you know, you have to involve ind independent um, providers. You have to in involve local uh, mental health care agencies. You have to involve um, the FQ FQHC. There's a lot of people that need to be involved to be able to, to build a, a resilient system um, where everybody has those MOUs set up um, so that they can be called to action um, and provide a sustained response. Um, we know that there's a lot of resources that come in, um, they, you know, break teams and whatever else that come in and, and provide services for a finite period of time. Um, but I think the trailing end of, of the mental health requirements and, and kind of more chronic uh, mental health issues are, are something that we are not fully addressing yet. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh We'll have to get some more information about that. Is that in your slide presentation, that particular program that you talked about? Um, no. That's okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, not yet. Um, <laughs> good information. I said it'd be good to see how that all develops and the lessons learned out of that, I think, will be very valuable for everybody. Okay, CJ, I warned you you're next, but I'm going to regress a little bit and ask if Holly has anything else to say about uh, mental health preparedness training or availability for child care providers. Thanks, Heather. Um, yes, definitely, especially with COVID um, impacting child care programs, that's the biggest need that we're seeing right now. Um, child care providers themselves need mental health support. Um, it's very stressful for them to put their own 
um, health at risk, but yet they're wanting to be a community leader and to be there um, for essential personnel and families that need to get back to work. So there's different layers. There's that childcare level, our childcare provider level, but then there's also the stress that children are under too and helping them um, understand their new norm, their new way of being in a child care program. So what we're interested in is how to expand child care health consultation um, to include aspects of mental health, um, looking at mental health supports that are currently available, and how to use those early childhood mental health specialists within child care programs. Um, so it's definitely something that's on the rise. I think after any kind of a disaster children are faced with um, tra trauma and needing social emotional supports, but we're really seeing it um, across the entire country right now with COVID effort. Holly. Okay, CJ, I know you've been sitting there waiting to go. Here we go. <laughs> Um, first question I had for you is we, we've all, I know this is not about COVID, but we rely, we force reliance on online programs when you're talking about the schools. We had to move things online and then we're dealing with resource inequities and stuff for students. But let's flip this to a natural disaster situation. The hurricane goes through, destroys a lot of critical infrastructure. Are the things we're learning now with COVID and trying to figure out availability, is that informing enough the essential nature of internet connectivity for the school to be able to provide that that resource for families or where do you see the gaps in that yeah I, well i think you've hit on a, a couple of them equity obviously is a, is a big one um you know the, the a lot a lot of districts have really struggled with that um that piece and and, and where we see it probably the most uh, so, some of our rural areas are probably the most challenged because they don't have the connectivity anyway and, and so that that creates a real, real issue uh, when I spent time in Puerto Rico, uh, they were, uh, you know, deeply engaged in trying to figure that, you know, crack that nut because they have all those infrastructure issues but from a technology standpoint as well, you know, the connectivity and, and then the access, you know, equity uh, piece and just not having having the equipment to do it. And, and then more importantly, up on, on top of that is um, that, that, you know, from a laying the groundwork standpoint, it starts with educator training, you know, training teachers how to deliver that instruction online. And that's, you know, that, that's one of the challenges. And we were fortunate in Joplin when we had our disaster, we moved to an online uh, platform, uh, went to one-to-one -one initiative over that summer due to some donations that we received that allowed that because we lost all our textbooks at the high school. And, and uh, the difference maker for us was one, we already had a plan on a one-to-one -one initiative that was sitting on a shelf. We just didn't have the funding for it at the time. It was a pre-disaster. And two, we'd been training our teachers for several years and moving that, moving that direction. So we went to one-to-one. -to -one, it really wasn't a, that much of a stretch for us, but the virtual delivery of instruction is a whole new ball game. So, um, so I think I think that's um, you know it's it's part it's a big part of it is equity and, and, and accessibility. Uh, big and a big part of it is that teacher training, and then the third third piece of it uh, that, that's uh, important as well is just just how how parents can be engaged in that and know what's going on and and um, and and support that that virtual learning uh, when, when their children are at home. Uh, which is another another huge challenge. So I, we're seeing some really unique um, approaches in some school districts. Though we we're seeing a district or two on the east coast that are actually doing parent trainings. You know, kind of a kind of uh, you know giving them that high level overview so that they have a better understanding of uh, of that delivery of instruction and how to how to uh, how they can best support their student. Thanks, CJ. As a parent that's had to do that myself too. Uh... Some of us are more technologically savvy than others, and it is indeed a challenge, I think, this new norm that we're living in. For sure. Okay, so I have a, a question now for the entire panel. Um, let me take a look here. So when we talk about what must be or maintained and sustained to support the, the parents and child giver, caregivers of children and why, some of the things I've heard today are child care, schools, mental health support, and tangentially housing stability, which con contributes to the mental health and well-being of the caregivers, which we've seen research shows has a direct impact on children's recovery. What else are we missing? Or is there, should we be ranking those things? Or what, what's the most important? I just want to kind of get your thoughts on that. So I guess we'll just start with Holly and kind of go through in the same order we just did. 
Sure. Um, to answer your question, I think it would be really difficult to rank them. Um, it's so dependent on what the region is faced with, with the disaster too. I think one of the things that's um, important to uphold are those partnerships that are being built too. Um, Jonathan mentioned it, CJ mentioned it, and ensuring that those partnerships are made well in advance of something um, taking place, a, a natural disaster during blue sky days. So helping partners understand whether it's um, the school industry or the childcare industry, um, what some of the vulner vulnerabilities of that age range are and what some of those caregivers are being faced with and asking for support um, well in advance um, is certainly a need. And I think it's a need that we um, can't just um, encounter once and think that we've tackled it, that it's, it's ongoing. There's a lot of new emergency management personnel that move into communities in and out and into different positions. Um, their caregivers, we, we all know that childcare has a lot of turnover. So it's kind of a constant reminder that partnerships are key and partnership development well in advance of something happening is key. They're ultimately going to help um, bring in resources when needed if you have those partnerships that are strong um, in advance of something happening. Um, donations of goods, funding opportunities, uh, all of those are key if partnerships are strong. Absolutely. Thank you, Holly. Jonathan? Money. Um, money. Uh, I, I think there is, uh, you know, local emergency management is um, understaffed, under-resourced, um, and there are, from our experience, um, not many requirements to specifically plan for the needs of children after disasters. Um, very few municipalities have um, a child annex that specifically addresses children in their community. Um, their children are treated like a, a, another population um, or just an adult population um, and children as we know are not little adults um, for that old adage. Um, and so I, I think to, to really begin to do some of this planning effectively, there needs to be some requirement. There needs to be staff time and a position that is supported to proactively work in the community to bridge the gap between schools and social services and all the human service organizations and their planning efforts to effectively and collectively address the needs of the community. That's not going to happen without funding. Um, and uh, you know, we can lean on community-based organizations to do a lot of this work, uh, and we can do that because they know their community so well, but they too are understaffed and under-resourced. And so um, building these partnerships or building these partnerships through a basis of some sort of funding and, and um, mandate to actually engage in some of this planning, um, I think is what, what really needs to happen to get us to that next level. Um, we can't always rely on the goodwill of of community organizations that are already doing so much to do all of the heavy lifting here. Um, so that's what I would, I would say. Um, and I know that's, that's a, uh, a lofty goal, um, but something has to be able to get us at the point where we are planning in blue sky times. And, you know, CJ, I'm sure you can speak to this. You know, there's a lot of work that happens after disaster to like do incredible recovery and incredible planning but getting communities to the point where they're doing that planning ahead of time and well ahead of something actually happening is where we, where we need our communities to be. And I'll, I'll just dovetail, I assume it's next, I'll just dovetail on his, his comments. Uh, you know, on the, on the cash side, I will tell you that, yeah, cash is king. Uh, you know, one of the mistakes I made after our disaster, uh, lesson learned is, uh, you know, when the news, national news media asked me what, what I needed, I was thinking of, you know, getting school reopened and what, you know, what we needed right then and there that may, we may not be able to get in time for the, for the restart of school. And I asked, I said, you know, we use, you know, and they said, what can people donate? I said, band instruments. Oh, that was a mistake. I, I, we got more piccolos than we knew what to do with. I mean, band instruments came in from all over the country. Really, what we needed was cash, and and um, you know that just really you know emphasizing the, the need for those cash donations. You know, it has a long shelf life; it's easy to store, and and uh, and you can buy stuff that you need as you need it. And, and so, you know, that's a piece of advice. But 
but from a from a relationship that pre need relationship standpoint that um, uh, that's been touched on by all of us, I think uh, that to me that's that's where that's the secret sauce of resiliency, really. You know, and, and as we all work towards trying to uh, build resiliency in our communities and and really think about how we can do that, I, I kind of liken it to this the concept of, of muscle memory. Um, you know, we, muscle memory is just a repeated repeated action of, of utilizing muscle over and over again until it just becomes second nature. And it's the reason my grandpa, who was 93 years old, could still get on a combine and, and harvest corn, even though he couldn't see well, but it, but he knew how to work all the all the handles and everything and just feel it. And, um, and, and resiliency is kind of that, that same way at the community level, but it's really exercising those resiliency muscles by having those pre-need relationships in place and then working together on a regular basis to problem solve everyday issues. We're not talking necessarily just tabletop exercises, but when we talk about children and youth issues, the mental and behavioral health issue isn't something that, was, what, that suddenly arise after a disaster. It was there prior to a disaster. Those underlying issues were already there. And, uh, and, and so problem solving some of those issues and working together to, to how, you know, on how you can approach those, those challenges actually, in my opinion, exercises those resiliency muscles to build, uh, to build more resiliency and get stronger than that. So when disaster does strike, those relationships are already in place and you already have, have done some planning together and kind of know how each other takes their coffee and how one another works together. So I, I think that's just really, you know, it can't be underscored enough um, that, 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 that uh, those relationships are, are there. The other, the other piece is just resource alignment, you know, making sure that you know what resources are available prior to disaster and how you, you know, how you, um, you, know, how, you know, where those resources are at and how they're being allocated and what the needs are and where the gaps exist and so on and so forth. And then, then the third third leg to that stool is really just that organized effort. How do you how do you organize that effort? You have these relationships, you have the resources, you now have that need, and uh, and, and really creating that organized effort to address the address the um, you know whatever challenges that response recovery may throw our way at that point. But but it's all grounded in those pre need relationships. Yeah, can I add one more thing to that? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think this goes back a little bit uh, about the work that, that Child Care Aware does um, and the gap that local emergency management could fill, and that's technical assistance. Um, we've run plenty of continuity of operations trainings in our community, in our communities. Um, and guess what? It's really, really hard for a child care center to sit down and write a coop plan. It's really hard. And it's a lot of effort and a lot of time, and it doesn't get done. Um, and so having the ability to have Places like Checker Aware and, and other um, organizations to help help these um, these childcare centers and family childcare homes and foster um, families and out of home placement families to actually you know sit down and write a plan and write a good plan um, well ahead of time is something that, that is needed. Well, thank you, everybody. Let me ask a follow on question then. When we're talking about relationships and the need for a funded mandate. Is a child, a children and youth task force, maybe the right relationship model? Should that be the funded mandate? Would that type of organization transcend regional differences? Uh, who should be on it, run it, fund it, et cetera? There's lots of questions that we can talk about in there. So, uh, CJ, we'll start with you. We'll go backwards this time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so children youth task force. Uh, you know, I think I think that that. You know the the investment is really in the in the training and, and the establishment of the framework and what what that would look like in in a, in a given because you know one of the things we know every disaster is different um, the resources in every community are different the relationships are different um, you know the history the political environment the, you know that that list goes on and on and on all these things that play into what makes makes every community unique. And so, so the way we like to approach establishing a children youth task force is really building on those strengths. You don't come in and predeter, you know, prejudge a community based on where things are currently. You build on the strengths that they have, and, and you find those local champions because those are the ones that are going to drive that work. It, it can't be a federal mandate, I don't think, or a, or even a state mandate. Although I think I think the state of California actually has uh, has. Uh, uh, some uh, legislation that's been passed that encourages the establishment of, in essence, a children and youth task force. They don't call it that, but it's it, it's it's, uh, it's 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 spelled out that way in the legislation and uh, encourages that at the county level, which I think I think is really important. Uh, but then it becomes about the structure and, and and the reality of it is when we talk about establishing a task force, everything in my view rises and falls on on the uh, on the strength of the leadership running you know leading that charge. 
And uh, if, if we don't have good leadership in place, uh, to even even put a children youth task force together, you know, to 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 get a ch children youth task force off the ground and and to get it moving forward and, and sustaining that effort over over a period of time, um, you know, the, that's where that's where in my view uh, those types of efforts and it doesn't matter if we're talking about children youth task force or preschool programming or child, you know, in, any type of initiative in a community, it always always starts and ends with leadership. So if I were to invest, you know, time and energy into something, it's really building that leadership capacity in the community identifying those key influencers, um, uh, people that want to step up and have a passion for this work um, and, uh, and, and getting those folks involved in building and building that task force around those people and then engaging uh, you know, your faith community, your human service agencies, your business community, your schools, your families and, and, and establishing what that will look like within that given framework. That, that's the way I would approach it. Excellent, Jonathan. Sure, it looks like we are very short on time here. Um, so I'll make my comments brief. Um, I think um, tapping into pre-existing structures within a community um, will make something like that successful, whatever you call it. Um, and so one example is we um, have set up one of our community resilience coalitions um, to be part of two examples. One, part of an, a pre existing bioterrorism and preparedness task force. There is now a separate group that meets, and this is a subcommittee. These coalitions are subcommittees of that task force that pre existed 9 11. Um, in one of our other communities, um, we've actually um, uh, tapped into and become part of the child welfare subcommittee of a local disaster coalition that was born out of the LTRG, the long term recovery group. And so looking for these pre existing structures. Um, that already have convening power, that already have credibility in a relationship and finding those, those local actors, those community champions um, is a model that seems to be working fairly well for what we've been a part of. Well, thank you. And again, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for talking today. I apologize. I thought we had a longer time session, so I got a little off track. <laughs>